la tulteuse et un mai miyabi. De l'ouem écuse de tous les beaux. Chi qui se ve check la mave un halla. Et check ou ramonta de la bonta. Mon père, et dit tu peux savoir que je filme des saisons main pager, devendre un chien content d'années plus tard. On a créé ton film gré par son fille à quoi pour être né. Et dit tu peux savoir qu'il servait d'être symbole pour les modes de changement qui étaient déjà envoyés transformer notre petite île. So, Geraint, what is Jerie? Jerie is a particular language which developed here in Jersey. It's got influences from Latin, it's descended from Latin, it's influenced by the Vikings who brought their Norse words here when they settled and set up the Duchy of Normandy, and obviously with um, long contact with France and England, we've introduced words from French and English and also words from around the world. It's tout à fait important, c'est pour les gens à parler. Quand les muscles parlent, un petit toi les semaines. Car il n'y a personne à la maison à parler avec. Jersey is still a, obviously a very beautiful place, but it has changed so much in the last hundred years. Um, urbanization, population, occupation, um, and industries changing from traditional farming and fishing through tourism and now finance taking over. Um, and now Gerie has got a real challenge to stay alive, not just as a language, but also carry on as part of our cultural identity. So why do you think that happened and what can we do about it? I think all languages have their challenges, even English, which is becoming an international language. France it sees itself challenged, not only mm. by English as an international language, but also by its regional languages, mm. which are reasserting their independence. Mm -hmm. Gérie, of course, was faced with French as the only official language until 1900, and English as the main language of commerce. Mm. Uh, and Gérie never had the official place, mm. uh, which means that we're never trying to recapture an official usage which used to exist. Mm. It was always a cult usage it was also always language of community mm. and it's the sort of community which we're trying to keep going <laughs> Since our first 
album launch in the Royal Square. We've done quite a lot of stuff. What have we done? We've done gigs all over Jersey. France, oh. uh, and up at, at Grante, yeah, we did the um, oh, yeah, the, the sunset concert at Grante. Yeah. Uh, we we played on the top of a hill with uh, a dancing puffin. Oh, you know what to do. Portuguese social club, remember that? Time Portuguese, wow, yeah, yeah. After the uh, after Jersey Live, yeah, yeah, Jersey Live folklore. So we've done a lot of stuff. Do you think we're making any difference to the future of Jerry? Or are we just having a laugh? In a small way, yes, I think we have made a... They love the songs, the kids. Mm. The kids at the school mm. love the songs. Oh, the have got their own little fan club. I don't know if you've noticed, but there is a little following oh, yes. of people that always yeah. seem to be yeah. and they sing along, they sing along with the chorus or something. Yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. and dancing and different And these are adults, right? Yeah, these are adults. You commissioned me to produce some music for schools, out of which Badlebeck was formed. Um, how helpful has that been, and what role do you think music can play in the revitalisation programme? I think it's been very important to have something modern in terms of a revitalisation programme. Getting some uh, contemporary interpretation has meant that we could go straight into presenting the heritage but not necessarily from, this is old stuff, it's boring, it's out of date. Now we can say, this is all um, contemporary, this is going on now, mm. this is why we have these things which are different from other places, mm -hmm. uh, and also um, presenting it in a, in a catchy way, uh, which basically gives it a, each theme a theme tune. Hey, la musique, sure. 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 Comment la musique peut aider? Ah, ben, c'est une chanson. Avec des bons musiciens. Comme tu as dit. Car ils sont des bons musiciens. Tandis qu'ils ne crient pas rien pour la politique, c'est magnifique. Allô! I think culture for me, uh, without going into all the various definitions, is about well-being of the individual. And that means equally understanding where people have come from and where they are now. Mm -hmm. and, and it's about people and making a difference and all those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And I think for us, we have a, um, a requirement, a need to keep the language alive. Mm -hmm. But I think my concern was when I first came as an assistant uh, minister three years ago, was how could you do that when there didn't seem to be a lot of succession planning. The Battle of X was very embryonic at that point in mm. time. And there didn't seem to be that connection with the youth. And mm. I think that's where it really runs. It mm -hmm. is that there are the people who still speak it today, who, mm. who meet on a regular basis, who are of the past, as mm -hmm. it were. But if you want to keep a language alive, you somehow got to engage the kids yeah. and get them focused on it and make them understand why it's important mm. and why it's different. So that's the question is, we've got this special language as part of our history and our heritage, but do you think it's a good idea to keep it alive? Or should we just say, well, no one really speaks it, I can't be bothered. What do you think? Show of hands, should we keep it alive? Be interesting. Yeah, so it's, it's kind of split, but that's cool. Uh, there's only a few hundred people that speak in this island, mm -hmm. and anywhere else in the world, I don't think there'll be anyone. So mm -hmm. if I go somewhere like Germany, mm -hmm. I speak it there, no one have a clue. That's true, yeah, and that's a really good point because if we're going to spend some of our resources teaching GRE in schools, then that could be money we could be spending teaching German. Yeah. So that's a really good point. I guess one of the um, questions that I have about that is uh, if we've got this special language that's unique to us as part of our history, wouldn't it be a bit of a shame to let it disappear completely? Yeah, well, actually it would be a shame, but 
I just wouldn't see why it would be helpful. That's, that's mm. just why I think. And then one, I th one answer to that is possibly that um, if we had Gerrier really popular in Jersey, then anyone coming to Jersey could join in with that. And it's a way of, of sharing, whether you're born here or not, whether you're rich or poor, whether you've got different backgrounds, it's a way of sharing that Jerseyness, if you see what I mean. Yeah. So it might help to sort of unite people within the island. What do you think about that? Actually, yeah, it would. If some people come over speaking Jerry and we would just learn it. Mm. So it could help with a sense of community, maybe. Yeah. I suppose it's what makes Jersey people unique. I suppose it's being able to have something that you can say. Yes. This, this, we, are, we are our own south, you yeah. know, as an island. Mm. We're separate to France and the UK, mm. and this is what we have. This is something that that, that is unique to us. It, and we, which, that? that makes us stand apart, something we can be proud of. And I think that's quite important as a community or, you know, as a culture that you've got something that is that little bit different. I think it's one of those things that uh, the past informs the present. Mm. And, uh, uh, and this is, uh, it's that kind of golden thread of existence that, that runs all the way through and people kind of recognise it. And here's another question. Do you think that music can help to keep the language alive? Definitely. Yeah? yeah? Well, uh, if a lot of people listen to music, like even if you're, you're young or old, so everyone would be listening to it, and you could just pick up words as you go, and then you might think, like, oh, I know a little bit now, I might want to get a class to kind of learn the whole language. So I think it would definitely spark off interest in people to learn it. What about making some Jerry music? Would that help you to learn it if you were going to sing in Jerry? Yeah, Charlotte, what do you think about that? Um, yeah, I um, I really think it would help because it would it would spark off interest, like Brooke said, and um, it would really just just have an interesting way of, of learning it. And that is to, if you're actually singing in Jerry A. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Or rapping. Do you fancy rapping in Jerry A? Um, well, other people might. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. What I think is the conundrum at the moment, we're in a stage where we're essentially about preserving or documenting Jerry um, and I don't know how you get to the point about um, it needs to be organic, so it needs to be, it's to be preserved and spoken, and needs, there needs to be an organic demand for that, and I, I don't see that we're quite in that stage yet mm. uh, as a society, and you know, we, we've developed, I'm not going to say exponentially, but very much since 1945, you know, in terms of the population, it's basically doubled, mm -hmm. demographics are completely different, um, a very cosmopolitan society, so mm. I think that's one of the challenges, but perhaps... Um, you know, maybe there's a demand for something that's authentic. The death of Gerrier has been imminently predicted since the early 19th century, still hanging on. The thing is that uh, in order to save Gerrier, it must be used. Gerrier is Jersey's hidden treasure. It's up to us to dig it up and share it with everyone. I think it's down to, to young people to, to understand uh, what Gerrier means, really, uh, to them. And to do that, music's a really good vehicle because it captures, um, we, you know, we learn from the past, it captures those parts of the past that we remember. It is, once again, that golden thread. And it allows young people to connect, and that's the thing that will really keep it alive. So you've got to connect with them, and they then have to connect subsequently with the others, and that will keep the, the language alive. Legion Jerry. Fonti corsia même par les yeux inconnus du siècle qui vient, ou fiotonti selon la mave. J'ai l'impression de la langue de nos enchaîtres, je la prendronti et chantonti en neuf chansons à tu dis.
jusqu'à la fin du temps ça tu veux. Mais pour acheter, dansons. So, yeah, there we are. Uh, because we've slightly um, changed the order because of the issue with the files. Um, yeah, I'll do my little introduction of Jersey. Uh, I should actually say thank you to the department for inviting me, of course. <laughs> Sorry, she, it's a shame Sheena's not here, but thanks, Sophie, for looking after me. Um, and it is a privilege to be here. Um, although we are few in number, <laughs> it's still good. Um, and also a privilege to, in some sense, represent Jersey, our culture and language um, of Gerier. Um, Jersey is a small but beautiful and slightly strange island, sitting as it does so close to France and yet being British, but with its own independent sense of self. Um, so, yeah, I thought it would probably be quite good to give you a quick overview of um, Jersey culture and kind of I don't need to tell you guys, no doubt, about language, language revitalization, but some of the kind of theoretical aspects that I'm uh, engaging with in my work. Um, as you may well know, that half the world's languages are endangered, more or less. Uh, and whilst many activists and academics are working towards uh, language safeguarding and revitalization, few studies have looked in depth at the potential role of music in this process. So I've been exploring one key aspect of the usefulness of music in language revitalization, uh, perhaps the most profound aspect, and that is how music can shape identity. Um, so through research, including my fieldwork in Jersey, my work aims to illuminate why and even how music could play a useful role via applied ethnomusicology. So Jersey's the largest of the Channel Islands, um, though still just 15 by 8 kilometers in size, so still pretty small, with a population of about 100,000. And Gerie, as we heard in the film, is a distinct dialect of Norman, which is unique to the island, having evolved there since the establishment of the, um, uh, the Duchy of Normandy in the year 933. So it's a Latin-based Romance language influenced by Norse, with traces of Celtic, Germanic, and latterly French and English. So it was commonly spoken across the island um, once upon a time. Uh, with many residents being at least bilingual, if not trilingual, with English and proper French, as the locals <laughs> usually call it. Um, but its use has declined over the past two centuries under increased Anglicisation. And Gerier is now severely endangered, with only an estimated 100 or so fluent speakers left in the island, almost all over the age of 65. So nowadays, less than 3% of the population claim any real working knowledge of Gerier, and despite all the cultural Gerier, uh, despite, but despite all the cultural changes, Gerier has survived, and recent years have seen the beginnings of revitalization thanks to the efforts of a few key activists and organizations. And music has been an active part of the revitalization strategy. Uh, so in 2012, I was commissioned by Lofus de Gerier, which is the 
government department to uh, look after the language, I guess. Um, so I was commissioned to arrange and record six Gerrier folk songs in a more current style for Gerrier teachers to use as a resource in, in their school's work. Um, and that commission really led to the founding of Badlebeck, which is the band we saw in the film, um, which is a 10-piece Gerrier pop folk band that grew out of that commission and is now relatively well established in the local cultural landscape performing regularly at festivals and cultural events, releasing recordings and appearing in the local press. Raising the profile of the language and helping shape its public image as a living part of local cultural identity. So Badlebeck's repertoire mixes recontextualized traditional songs, tr uh, translated pop covers and original songs arranged in an eclectic style that draws on pop and folk influences from around the world. And at this early stage of revitalization, there is a real need to engage with the public and address issues of language ideology and local identity. Uh, not simply to teach about the language and its history, but to present a positive vision of how Gerrier can contribute to the richness of our society and to help people identify with and appreciate that personally and collectively. So, Madhini is this short film that I made during my master's. Um, as part of a module called Ethnographic Film for Music Research, um, which was taught by Barley Norton, who's actually um, now my supervisor for my PhD, happy to say. Um, and so in this module, we learned basic filmmaking skills and explored the possible uses of film as a research tool in our own contexts. Um, so obviously my context was, was Jersey and Gerrier, and I guess I'd just try to give an impression of the island and the language, as well as my personal connection to the story. And I was really lucky to have that old footage that my dad shot when he was a fisherman. It was amazing. And I thought that was a great metaphor, you know, the idea of you know, the culture as a sea that's always changing. Um, and Mother Nye is a, a mariner, a sailor. So, you know, just sort of took that from, from the song that we sang and made that link. And you know, hopefully kind of give a, an idea um, of the work and the, the, the context. Uh, sorry, it's a bit glitchy streaming it from the internet, but, um, but hopefully it came across okay. <laughs> um, so there are a few key conceptual foundations that I'm working on um, or from. So I thought I'd just kind of run through them. A lot of them will be very familiar, but it just makes sense to kind of tell you where I'm coming from, really. Um, so. Starting from the start, culture. Um, so, you know, taking this from the you know, kind of recent years in anthropology that have um, seen culture as not so much a fixed entity, but unbounded, contested, negotiated, and historically produced. So, indeed, every language, and for that matter, music, is subject to the same cultural evolution, fought out in everyday life where relations of power are exercised. Um, Similarly, both collective and individual identities are always evolving and constructed through time. So I'm broadly making use of a non-essentialist conception of identity as a process, rather than a fixed or unified thing. This sense of self is embedded and integrated into an environment within which it dynamically evolves. So um, regards culture, people like Mary have talked about this, and regards identity, people like Stuart Hall and Judith Butler um, amongst many others, have explored that uh, constructivist approach. Um, so relating that to music, um, loads of musicologists have written about that, but in particular, um, one called Simon Frith uh, has written about the way that music doesn't just reflect values and identities, but it constructs a social experience, and listeners then adopt positions and take on identities in the course of performing the meaning of this experience to themselves. Um, so central to the idea of that is, is the way in which aesthetics can embody ethics. And uh, an understanding of individuality, social relations and cultural ideals form constitutive elements of a musical aesthetic. Um, and as, as Fr says, uh, on the basis of this, um, ethical codes and social ideologies are understood. So 
I'm thinking about the way that that can be engaged with in terms of language revitalization. So musical sounds thus communicate, mobilize, and organize collective identities and context. And there's a quote from Frith which says, music constructs our sense of identity through the direct experience it offers the body, time, and sociability. Experiences which enable us to place ourselves in imaginative cultural narratives. So obviously the concepts of uh, language ideology is also really key. Um, and again, I don't, I'm sure I don't need to tell you guys um, some thinking about language ideologies which envision links of language to group and personal identity, to aesthetics, to morality, and to epistemology. So, essentially engaging with um, questions of what is language for? Um, clearly it is more than just descriptive and propositional, but has performative and expressive roles. Uh, with inevitable consequences where language use is contested. So understanding, engaging with and reshaping language ideology is obviously a necessary step in, in, in language revitalization. So um, on a strategic level, sociolinguists have proposed various me measures and paths to revitalization. Um, and this is actually one area that I thought would be good to, um, to really ask you guys about because I, I, there's a certain amount of literature that I've come across and read that summarizes these paths and strategies. Um, but um, I'm mainly drawing on um, a, an article from Darken that sums up um, a lot of the stuff, which is relatively old. So there may be new stuff, recent stuff, that I'm not aware of, which I'd, be really, um, I'd really appreciate knowing about. So starting from the start, Darken um, sort of um, points to Fishman's reversing language shift as a key text. Um, obviously, which you guys know about, uh, with his graded intergenerational disruption scale. Uh, and this has been obviously influential, but also critiqued in recent decades. So according to Darken, many of the different measures that have come through, such as UNESCO scale, Weber and Mellis's socio profiles, Giles's ethno-linguistic vitality, Lewis and Simon's extension of Fishman's Gids, um, and the uh, Catherine Wheel from Struble um, generally do no more than report on the ethno-linguistic vitality of a language um, as opposed to being a strategy for engaging. Although um, what Dark Ken does talk about is the idea of combining Strubel's Catherine Wheel model with Weber and Mellis's socio-profiles approach, uh, working towards, and another quote, um, a comprehensive and multidisciplinarily conceived and multidimensionally oriented total concept that is intertwined with social reality as a prerequisite for successful language revitalization. So I'm simply proposing that music should be considered as a potentially important element of this total concept, in particular for the way that it can contribute to the development of a cultural identity and influence language ideology. So it's a matter of seeing whether it's um, strategizing around combining the Catherine Wheel with socio profiles or whatever. I'm thinking about how music can um, be um, strategically placed into that, into those models. Um, and uh, so despite profound links between music, language, and cultural identity, a distinct gap exists between ethnomusicology and sociolinguistics in the area of language revitalization. Musicologists like Frith, as I've mentioned, but also um, Denora and Stokes and various others have explored how a constructivist de definition of identity relates to the experience of music and sociolinguistics uh, linguistics like Soas's own uh, Julia Salabank um, have also stressed the importance of language identity. But no in-depth studies uh, to my knowledge, have explicitly brought, explicitly brought uh, an ethnomusicological perspective to bear on the proactive reconstruction of cultural identity towards language revitalization. Now, so now we're thinking about applied ethnomusicology. Um, so, quick definition. Applied ethnomusicology is the approach guided by principles of social responsibility which extends the usual academic goal of broadening and deepening knowledge 
and understanding towards solving concrete problems and working towards, uh, uh, toward working both inside and beyond typical academic contexts. Um, and the ICTM also formally advocates the use of ethnomusicological knowledge in influencing social interaction and cultural change, um, always within the context of social responsibility and, and ethical uh, approach. Um, so my main aim is to explore new ways to use music to positively foster a genuine grassroots engagement and identification with Gerie using an applied methodology and a constructive concept constructivist conception of identity to help the community shift language ideology and reconstruct a cultural identity that embraces Gerie in a deep way. So this would take a non-exclusive approach where anyone can connect to this local identity via engagement with Gerie, whether they were born in Jersey or not, creating fictive kinship that transcends perceived social, cultural and genetic boundaries in a globalised multicultural world. That's my vision uh, and of course um, that can be contested, there can be others that will potentially want to use Gerie for very nationalistic reasons and that's an issue that I've got to Deal with. And you saw me slightly browbeating that poor child in the film, I would say, saying why I think Jerry could be helpful. And of course, he had no choice but to agree. But, um, but it's a genuine issue, and a lot of, a lot of people um, don't get the vision yet and perhaps think that Jerry uh, could be a danger to that vision of multiculturalism that is accepting. And, Jer and Jersey is, in fact, a very multicultural place. We've got quite a big Portuguese community of which um, that lad was part of. Um, there's a big Polish community, there's you know, various seasonal workers that come in um, as well from all kinds of places. Um, those two communities are very well established, they've been there for a few generations, so they're the biggest. Um, but there's quite a wide range. There's about 50% of people who live in Jersey are not born there. Um, so the idea of creating uh, a a uh, Gerier for the future that is inclusive is, is quite crucial to it ever um, revitalizing. Um, so what I thought would be good is to talk a little bit about one particular musical ex example. I don't know how we're doing for time, but um, I'll just keep going until you tell me to shut up, basically. <laughs> um, so um, the example I wanted to play you actually is from the Island Games um, opening ceremony. And um, so the Island Games are a biennial international multi-sports event for small islands organised uh, by the International Island Games Association. And the 2015 Island Games were held in Jersey, involving 24 islands and 2,700 athletes from around the world. The opening ceremony was designed to welcome the athletes um, to the island with a suitable mix of traditional and celebration uh, of tradition and celebration, and will focus on what makes Jersey unique, according to the website of, their, of the organisers. Um, so it was held on the 27th of June, 2015, uh, with a live audience of 6,000 and several thousand more watching and listening elsewhere. Um, and as planned cultural events go in Jersey, this was as big as is ever likely to happen in the island. It's difficult to ascertain how much of the population engaged with the ceremony and how influential it was. But it's certainly significant that most important organisations that are themselves components of local structures of power, including government, education, police, major local businesses, sports and youth clubs and local media, put a great deal of emphasis and attention on it, as well as resources. So both music and Gerie were key elements of the ceremony which provides interesting data and raises questions about the current status of music and language in the conscious celebration and construction of Jersey's cultural identity, both within local society, but also in the representation of that identity to an international audience. So by, lib by deliberately uh, choosing to signal to the outside world that Gerie is integral to the most positive representation of the Jersey identity on an international stage, that message then reverberates back very powerfully through the local population. It is via the demarcation of the difference to the other that the concept of that difference begins to crystallize in the local psyche, forming part of their habitus. 
Uh, so the ceremony itself had two main sections, the formal and the informal. During the formal section, the International Ireland Games, Ireland Games Oath was recited first in Gerrier, followed by English. And this was followed by a performance of Jersey's anthem for the Games, which is also sung in both Gerrier and English. More about that song later. Um, and after the Games were uh, officially declared open, the informal part of the ceremony began. And Badlebeck performed a 15-minute set. Uh, the last song was effectively the finale of the event, after which the athletes left the park. So let me give you a quick description of our performance um, as an example of the kind of stuff we do. Uh, so knowing that very few audience members would speak any Gerrier or recognise our traditional songs, our approach was to make the music as accessible as possible, using a combination of danceable rhythms, familiar pop folk sounds, simple melodic phrases, constant musical developments to maintain interest, audience interaction, um, and we used two uh, short translated cover versions as well as um, of sort of well-known songs that they'd, they'd know as well as our traditional stuff. So at a basic level, the, wor the words form a musical, emotional, performative sound event that theoretically does not need to be understood to be enjoyed. There were also two short pauses between the songs in which I could explain a certain amount in English. The first song was the song featured in the film, actually, uh, it's a traditional four-bitter called Tandis que bon Medini Bay, which translates as a good sailor drinks while he waits. It's a good old drinking song um, to be sung on the island during bad weather. Um, so our version is considerably faster than is usually sung and the high energy works well as a good opener for most gigs. The second song was Jean Grosjean, uh, which is one of the oldest regional folk songs we play um, of anonymous origin with various versions known across Normandy. Again, our version is up-tempo and danceable. There's also a key change and a segue into the next song, which the crowd would hopefully recognise as the famous pop song, I Like to Move It, but translated into Gerrier, which is J'aime bien me uh, So that was a bit of fun. And then the finale was a real one-off um, for us as a band. The first a sort of real special occasion of, of which this, this photo um, is taken from. Um, it was a cover version of the Beatles with a little help from my friends. And I had the idea to do this song as soon as we were asked to play at the ceremony. Uh, my thinking was to involve a choir called Les Amis, uh, Les Amis Choir, um, which is um, actually a choir formed of uh, local adults with learning disabilities and or associated conditions. Uh, Les Amis is the charity that helps support them and the choir is uh, formed from that charity. Les Amis is French for the Friends, as you may well know. So uh, I had, had attended their Christmas concert in December 2014 and asked them if they'd be willing to perform with us at the Games. And as a well-known sing-along song with a positive message of community and friendship, both Les Amis and the Island Games organising committee were happy with the song choice and we focused on getting the choir to learn just the chorus in Gerrier. Um, as you'll hear, because I'll, I'll play a clip if we can get online, um, the arrangement for the band was fairly similar to the original track with the um, addition of Les Amis Choir um, and alongside them was um, a children's choir, um, the Fleur de Lis Signing Choir and the Jersey Youth Orchestra also um, joined in. So Badlebeck sang the first two verses in Gerrier accompanied by the choirs for the chorus. We then switched to English for the rest of the song. Um, and after the final chorus, the band vamped on three chords as an outro and the choirs and backing vocals exchanged two alternating phrases in Gerrier and English. And over the top of this, I sang all the names of the 24 islands competing at the Games, ending on Jersey, of course, with a final flourish from the band. I'll play you a few little clips from it so you get an idea. Yeah. <laughs>
watching us. Enjoy the games. So the feedback on the performance was overwhelmingly favourable. The public profile of Gerrier was raised and by linking the language with a collective celebration of local identity, including all the positive community values associated with such an event, a monolingual language ideology is inherently, though not overtly, challenged. Gerrier is put in the limelight via music, potentially increasing identification with it as a key element of distinctive local cultural heritage. This is true for the audience as well as for the various performers involved, the youth orchestra and the choirs. And not long after the ceremony, I received a thank you letter from Sean Findlay, the uh, managing director of Les Amis, which said it was an amazing experience for all the people involved. Rest assured, the buzz and excitement that has been going around Les Amis in the past week will continue for some time and it is a uh, credit to your vision and inspiration to involve adults with learning disabilities and showcase, showcasing Jersey as an inclusive island. And this showcasing of inclusivity as an aspect of cultural character, performed via song that had Gerrier as a central feature, demonstrates how music can act as a conduit of fictive kinship. The intention here is the promotion of social cohesion, with Gerrier forming a constitutive part of a non-exclusive enactment of community and citizenship. Such intertwining of music and language with communal solidarity, inclusivity and optimism exemplifies the integration of aesthetics and ethics and the ongoing narrative of cultural identity. So, the Island Games opening ceremony is a useful example of how music can contribute to the evolution of language ideology and construction of cultural identity via the representation of the collective self to the other. And the echoes from this performance will hopefully continue for some time. But what about the future? So um, now I've started my PhD, there are three main projects that I'm working on. There may be others that will uh, emerge or evolve over the next uh, year or so, but we'll see. Um, so I'll talk about a little bit about each of those. What, what time am I supposed to finish, just to think? Uh -huh. so, okay, that's fine. Um, yeah, okay, that's good. Well, I'll, I'll uh, yeah, we're pretty much there. Um, so, yeah, so I've got these three projects and there's also, separate to my work, there's a digitization project going on and then there's ongoing schools and community work. Um, so our new album, um, I could play you We'll see how we're doing for time, but I could play you some clips from the album, some exclusive clips. The album's not out yet, it's due out in kind of probably September, October time. It's a mix of stuff, we've got some traditional material on there. Viva la, 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 um, we've got a, our kind of pop folk style stuff on there, which sounds a bit more contemporary. Um, we've got these cover versions. We've actually teamed up with Liz Ami Choir to record that Beatles song, which is going on the album, which is great. Could it be everybody? Oh, I get by the help from my friends. Mm, I get hurt a little help from my friends. Ooh, I'm gonna try. Leonard Cohen cover on there as well. Dance me à ta beauté, à tout un violon à phare. Dance me le travers du dessous, pour que j'ai d'a fait ça. Lève me comme un bronc d'olive, et c'est mon colombier. Dance me au but du dessus. Mm, dance me. 
Speedy uh, there's some interesting remixes, which is a bit of an experiment, some electro remixes of our stuff, uh, which I think will be quite enjoyable. There's also a kind of comedy uh, bonus track at the end. In fact, that's only one minute long, so I could play you, I could play you that. Uh, yeah, here we go. So it's called, the title of the, of the track is Gerrier for Lovers, Lesson One. How do you do? Come way. Good evening. Can I get you a drink? De piety a bath. I'll have a cider, please. A siege pour ma six pieds. Would you like to dance? De piety danse. Of course, Bassa. Oh yes, we oui, ja. <laughs> So there you go. That's the the closing bonus comedy track on the album. Um, so yeah, that's the main sort of initial project for the band. Uh, then the other project that I'm sort of in talks with um, with the the kind of organisers and uh, the Jersey Education Department in particular, the music department. Um, is a project around Liberation Day. So uh, the 9th of May is a public holiday in Jersey known as Liberation Day, which celebrates the long-awaited official surrender of the occupying Nazi forces on that day in 1945. And we have a picture of uh, this particular square now known as Liberation Square in 1945 and the same square last week. Um, uh, you can, it's a slightly different angle, but you can see that's the very same building there um, in the center kind of thing. Um, so there's always a, a large scale formal celebration in the capital and uh, Gerrier is, live music is part of it and Gerrier is part of it, in particular focused around a song that you heard me do a, a sort of a cappella version in, in the film, Mon Bio Petit Gerrier. Um, so this is a very popular song um, that has become a kind of unofficial of, uh, anthem of, of the island. It was the games anthem sung in the, in the island games. Um, and, and it's sung every year on Liberation Day. Um, and I have to skip through some of this basically, but essentially the song is performed just before the reenactment of the, um, the, the changing of the flag. So they took down the Nazi flags and hung the Jersey flag and the, the Union Jack, I think, Union Jack in particular, uh, the Jersey flag may have made an appearance, but so they reenact this every year and just before that they sing this song. It's usually performed by one adult, perhaps with a backing choir. The first verse is in Gerrier and then it switches to, to English. Um, so my idea really is to work with the local music department to essentially try and teach this song to as many local school kids as possible, first of all. 
and then draw a choir from across the island that will either perform in the um, official ceremony or um, after the um, ceremony. So that's the, th this year, single adult performing the, the Gerrier part and then the choir joins in and the crowd join in from the English onwards. Um, but, but after the ceremony, there's a street party where there's kind of a 1940s themed sort of social event. And that's another alternative. So I'll perhaps get the, um, the children's choir to perform at that and then they can do some English stuff as well. And it might, might be a preferential place to, to situate that. And because then we get two bites of the cherry, they'll still perform it formally and then we can do it informally um, as well. Okay, so the other quick thing is the, um, the Jersey Song Project where I want to facilitate and curate uh, collaborative songwriting between generally young local musicians and generally older GRA speakers, leading towards a high profile performance event where the bands will sing their songs, which they may only have like a tiny bit of GRA in, but that doesn't matter as long as it's getting that interaction. Um, and it's encouraging intergenerational exchange um, using a buddy system, which could then potentially lead towards a sort of master apprentice style relationship, um, which would be really, really good. Um, and then the other ongoing work is this digitization project. So it's been initiated by uh, Dr. Julia Salabank from here, from SOAS, and uh, Dr. Murray Jones from Cambridge. It's now being uh, led and conducted by a local team um, with Avril Wells um, putting that together, coordinating that. And then the ongoing um, schools work that is happening and community work. So Lofi Stugere are working away at that. They've currently got four teachers, although one's going to retire at some point pretty soon. Um, and they've also kind of got the tentative approval from the government, local government, to um, get two more teachers trained up. Obviously, they will have to become fluent enough in Geria to then teach. That's a bit of a process, but um, this language plan has now been submitted and approved, so it's just a matter of finding the money for it, basically. Um, so that's ongoing work. Um, so, to conclude, um, essentially I have proposed that as a unique way of experiencing the ongoing negotiation of individual and collective identity, music offers a realm of interaction through which communities can shift language ideology and reconstruct a cultural identity that embraces the endangered language in a deep way. The proactive application of a constructivist approach through music necessarily involves an appreciation of aesthetics from an ethnomusicological perspective. But whilst there is great potential here, there is also complexity and risk requiring research sensitivity. In order to avoid the dangers of top-down political manipulation, paternalism, and maybe even problematic forms of nationalism, careful research and evaluation is needed. The other important point um, to remember is, is that popularity does not equal revitalization. Um, it's definitely been a shift in recent years of local attitudes, um, but there's still a very long way to go. And whilst few people in Jersey these days would be happy to see Geria disappear completely, there remains a certain inertia, perhaps even an ambivalence, uh, an ambivalence towards converting this positive attitude into genuine revitalization, which takes proactive engagement, patience, diligence, and perseverance beyond just listening to a pop band singing Beatles covers. And the language is still critically endangered and there is no guarantee it will survive more than another decade or two. As Julia Salabank wrote, overtly expressed attitudes are not actions. Positive attitudes cannot save a language without concrete measures. So maybe it is here that the co-imbrication of music, language and cultural identity has its deepest value. Applied ethnomusicology projects engaging in language activism will need to achieve a balance that is both realistic about the challenges and complexities and optimistic about the potential for positive outcomes. But in shaping identity, a course may be set for the future. To some degree, the, the chance that language activism is likely to succeed in the long run can be measured by the extent to which it etches its message into the core elements of collective identity. This course serves as a touchstone for credible and lasting interventions. So, I have some questions for you. <laughs> That's basically it for my talk. But what would be really interesting is to get perspectives from 
you guys, obviously. Um, and in particular, thinking about other work, research, or concepts, or revitalization strategies that I should be aware of. Um, but also thinking about how you think I might be able to evidence change. You know, I'm doing ethnography as I work. Um, but are there any sort of measures or ways of evidencing um, sort of these changes and, and the sort of effectiveness of these musical interventions? Um, and then, uh, yeah, just any other questions or, or critiques that you guys have would be more than welcome. Thank you very much. Merci, Van Fay. Thank you. Mm. Um, that little discussion you had with the students. Um, yes. I just noticed, so they don't speak German. No. And, uh, okay, so I just find it interesting that I read uh, the questionnaire. Your questionnaire was all written in English. Uh -huh. People were asking questions or in English. Yeah. So I just thought, in a way, that while you were saying that language, it's really important that to to encourage people to speak German, but you were using English. Uh -huh. But I didn't understand it was because they couldn't Because they couldn't, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I, yeah. so do they, like children, some children, they do seem like, oh yeah, it is important, mm -hmm. to, important for us, for our identity and this and that. Yeah. But do they have any, any access to language classes or anything like that? Not a lot at the moment, because it, it's fairly under-resourced, ultimately. Okay. There's a, um, in all the state schools, so that's, you know, the kind of, um, yeah, most of the schools, not all the private ones, but the uh, state schools have an introduction to the language yeah. in year four of primary. Okay. Uh, and it's literally, at, at the moment, I think, one term. Mm -hmm. It's very, very minimal. Um, it gives them a flavour. And um, from there, then there are at the moment there are some um, voluntary like after school clubs and some lunchtime things I think, um, but it's pretty tough right now because of that reason. H having said that, the um, like I say, the general attitudes across the community is, is improving, yeah. and um, there are some good sort of initiatives on that front. And also, this new language plan will change the amount of engagement they can have so it will have I think it they're planning something like um, certainly more opportunity so so they would get taught across three years yeah. um, they're also planning an introduction very early on um, to like an infant level okay. and they are if it goes through there'll be like a language officer full-time to do community engagement and provide external okay. stuff outside of schools so that hopefully as things progress there'll be more opportunity but at the moment it's really really minimal and that's why you know things like I think Badlebeck out, you know out there doing gigs yeah. and selling CDs is, is a positive thing because it's one other way they can connect to the language so yeah. I really yeah. like the idea of, of bringing music into especially to engage young people I yeah think. But I also agree with you when you say being popular doesn't mean that the revitalization work is yeah, done. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, also, um, like you said, the language plan that they are going to do more things because if you just if they are interested in music, mm -hmm. interested in the lyrics, yeah. But then other than that, they don't really have any other things to build up their vocabulary. They yeah. can't really use it in absolutely. any any daily interactions yeah. other than just singing songs that provided yeah. by you so yeah. I think it will, it's a long way to go very long way yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but it is really good I really like the idea of bringing young people mm. uh, into these to engage them yeah. in, with music I think it's very very interesting and then, thank you yeah, yeah. yeah I, like, I really like that should, idea yeah, yeah thanks it, yeah it should be fun to see how these other projects go yeah. and how involved the kids get basically because with so. mine I was, like, I, I was trying to use um Books to get mm -hmm. uh, kids interested. Uh -huh. They are more interested in TV shows. Yeah. Like I, I, I mean, to me, it's, it's almost impossible at the moment to mm -hmm. provide any any TV shows in mm -hmm. their language. So right. I think it's really difficult. And then yeah. Music wise, I mean, I, I can't do it myself. But mm -hmm. yeah, this is really good. But it could be a good yeah. a good way yeah. for sure. Do you have any questions? And we can 
can also just carry on the discussion in the... Uh, Down the pub. <laughs> can I ask a question before we forget? Yeah, of course. Um, two, actually, really quick. Um, mm. Was there any resistance from the, the schools in terms of, you know, the, this language learning taking up curriculum at a time which they felt, you know, forget what the students thought, but the yeah. teachers, the heads as well, as you can imagine, mm. was there sort of resistance there? Yeah, um, I don't know all the details, but I'm pretty sure there, there was some. Um, there was definitely uh, a debate in the uh, states, the, the states of Jersey, which is the local government, whether it, the funding should actually be cut and it should be sort of deprioritized. And thankfully, that was, you know, reversed and it's not being cut. And now they're, you know, they're sort of pledging to do more. Um, but certainly, some of the um, private schools are just not up for it. Um, you know, they, they've got Spanish and German and Chinese and, and the in, important things for their kids' future to learn. So they just don't want to provide that option. But because the, the government schools are able to roll it out kind of, uh, you know, just kind of in a compulsory way, they've just had to swallow it. So I don't know whether in terms of those head teachers, etc., there was any resistance. It seems to have gone down pretty well. Um, and like I say, because the community on the whole is these days more positive and doesn't want to see it disappear, they're happy to have it in their schools. Um, so, yeah. Last yeah. No, that's cool. In, in, in an ideal world, maybe not in an ideal world, but in a sort of realistically sort of utopian world, uh -huh. what level of language acquisition do you think is possible for you know, the, the youth of, of Jersey? Are you, are you realistically expecting, um, let's say, if, if things continue as they are, so mm. education rolls out, mm. you know, are you in the sort of basic conversational level? Mm -hmm. or more focused or more likely to be focused on keeping it in circulation even if it isn't, you know, that everyday sort of... Mm. As a kind of sort of cultural marker yeah, type that's thing. Yeah, that's so sort of um, kind of cliche and cheesy. Yeah, yeah but that's, that's the realities sort of we've got to look at, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I can't say for sure because I'm, I'm not in Lofi area and I you haven't been directly involved with the language plan, but obviously it is key to, to be realistic about what kind of goals are achievable. Uh, I've been involved with this for five years and I'm still a long way from fluent because it's really hard to learn Jerry, you know, and I'm sort of back and forth to London, which doesn't help. But um, yeah, you can't have that immersive experience that you can have if you just go to France or something for a few months. So fluency is, is a really difficult thing to achieve. and it's a major question for how it, how it can possibly survive this generation or so passing. In that respect, you know, you're talking about how, how the evidence change. Mm. Do you think the, the, the current method of, of measuring sort of language acquisition and language yeah. skill is necessarily appropriate for, you know, Jersey? Or do you think that there needs to be a different yeah. method of, of gauging whether, you know... How it's going kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. No, again, it's a really good point. There's been, a, believe it or not, a GCSE Gerrier on offer for a few years. No one's ever, oh, one person's taken it and they failed. So, um, <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm building up. It wasn't me. I'm building up towards taking it. I should, I should take it. Um, but yeah, so it's a tough one. Absolutely. And how, yeah, how you what you're aiming at, how you measure it, how you build towards it. I'm so glad you're in your head with me. Yeah. All good. Excellent. Well, I'm sure we'll, we'll keep talking. We can all keep talking. Yeah. We'll go to the pub. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Merci, Bande Fe.